Welcome to the Protecting Your Nest podcast. Before we begin today's episode, I wanted to remind you that I have a link tree as a way to link you to all of my content beyond the podcast, introducing you to my YouTube channel, continuing medical education via qmedcme.com, and of course, featured videos like the one I have on how to adopt a low-carb diet. And of course, I have a two-page guide on which foods you should avoid or eat on, a, on your low-carb journey. Now, prior to today's recording, I had asked myself a, a simple question. I wonder how many other clinicians are sharing the healing message of metabolic health. So I went to the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners search engine, and I found that only 11 uh, clinicians in my home state of Illinois were listed, and I only found 80 in California where my guests currently live. So it looks like we have some work to do. You know, those low numbers are a reminder that we have so much more work to do as it relates to spreading the metabolic health message. But thankfully, thankfully, we do have physician champions who are doing just that. And today's guest is no exception. Today's guest is Dr. Brian Lindkis. Dr. Lindkis is a eternal medicine doctor in San Diego, California. He received his BS in biology from UC Irvine and MD from USC Medical School. And he was a little frustrated with standard medical care as I was, as he tried to help his obese and chronic disease patients to heal. And he found that they weren't healing until he discovered and they discovered a ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting. So he's doing a great job hosting uh, Best Life Medicine's podcast, which is his uh, newest project. And of course, uh, one of the famous low carb MD podcast hosts with his buddy, Dr. Tro. So my friend, uh, I'm so happy to finally get you on a podcast so we can talk about what us docs do in the clinical setting. I welcome you to the Protecting Your Nest podcast. Hey, Doc. Thanks for having me. It's awesome yeah. to be here. You're the man. Last time we were hanging out, we were in San Diego at the Metabolic Health Symposium having uh, dinner together, getting a chance to meet your wife. You met my wife. I met your brother. It was just a, it's like a family reunion, man. So it took us so long, right? Yeah, that was awesome, man. I had a great time with you. Yeah, it you was guys a lot are characters. of characters. Yeah, well, no, that's my wife, man. That's not me. <laughs> well, I can't wait to get her on. I'm going to get you both on the podcast. And you better be nice to me today because it could be payback time. <laughs> well, we'll see how it goes. I can't make any promises, but, but I agree, man. It's so cool to like, you know, you know, break keto bread with, uh, you know, with some uh, like-minded individuals. And it was definitely cool. I definitely had a lot of talking to do with your, because your brother sat right next to me and it was just cool to get to know him as well. We have a lot of similar ways of thinking in terms of holistic medicine. So let's talk a little bit about how you discovered the healing power of low-carb keto and, and even carnivore in your practice. And what, what was the moment, when was that moment when that finally happened? Well, you know, it's always going to circle back around to Jason Fung, right? Just like all the rest of us. <clears throat> but for me, I've always struggled with weight. You know, as a kid, I was overweight. Then I went to high school. I played football and I wrestled. So my weight would yo-yo up and down. In football, I'm only five foot eight, so I'd get up to like 200 pounds. You know, the guys next to me were 260, you know, big six foot four guys. I'm five foot eight in the middle, you know, on the defensive line. So I'd have to gain weight. And so actually, what, in my senior year, I realized, uh-oh, wrestling season's coming. And I wrestled at 160. So I'd go from 200 to 160. So I would lose 40 pounds from football season to wrestling season. And it wasn't a lot of fun to do that. So then after high school, I started gaining weight. And, you know, at college, you gain, you know, your 15 pounds or so. And then med school, you gain a few pounds. Then residency, you gain a few pounds. Then practicing for, you know, at that point, probably 12 years in, in standard practice, working 60-hour weeks and all that kind of stuff. And uh, the pounds just kept piling on. So I was doing the ADA's recommended diet. I'm having Melba toast and, you know, oatmeal for breakfast and green shakes and all that stuff. And I'm gaining weight. And I'm thinking, what is wrong with me? There's some endocrine problem. And then one of my patients came in and he had lost 46 pounds or something like that. And I'm like, hey, man, what are you doing? Teach me. And he goes, you're not going to like it, doc. He goes, I'm, it's called the fast diet. And I was like, there's no such thing as a fast diet. It takes time to lose weight. It should be two pounds a week, that kind of thing. And, uh, he said, no, I fast two days a week. So it was Tuesdays and Thursdays. He was basically eating 500 calories, no carbs. And I said, well, what about the other days? He said, well, I eat whatever I want. And I'm like, well, I can't lose. This is like, we got to check you for cancer and diabetes and thyroid problems. But it turns out, you know, I started researching fasting and who do I come across? Jason Fung, the king of fasting. 
and reached out to him and I said, I don't understand this so because I was asking my patient, hey, if you're fasting on Tuesday, then Wednesday, you must want to eat twice as much food. He said, no, it's weird. I'm not hungry on Wednesday. I said, well, how can you not be hungry when you didn't eat the day before? You know, and I started studying this and uh, like, how could this possibly be? And, you know, for me, I was like shoving down food at lunchtime. So I wouldn't go into starvation mode, you know, and I was just eating at my desk because I was in such a hurry all the time. And I started realizing, oh, maybe you can fast. You know, maybe you can start cutting carbohydrates. So then I reached out to Jason Fung and he was very uh, kind and gave me some pointers. And I was pre-diabetic at the time. A1, my three-month sugar average was 5.9. Sugars are running in the 120 range. And I thought, man, I got to do something because my whole my mom's whole side of the family has diabetes. So I'm like, I don't want to go down that path. And I was working out five or six days a week on top of that. So I said, how could this possibly be? And so then I started, you know, my first experience actually was at Low Carb uh, San Diego. I went to that conference and I started realizing, oh, my goodness, it's not just about weight loss. There's all kinds of stuff with metabolic health. And once I started understanding, then I said, well, maybe I can apply this to my patient care. I love that. And and what's really interesting is you said that your entire uh, the, your mom's entire side of her family were diabetic. Um, and, and, and so for those who are listening, I don't really care if everybody in your family is diabetic. That does not have to be your path. I think that's really important. And yes, it's hard to hear that maybe oatmeal is not the best way to start today. I literally just had a patient today who we talked about you know, what she was eating and, and she kept coming back. I can't eat oatmeal. I said, you can eat oatmeal, but why start your day with oatmeal when you can start your day with something that has less than 28 carbs? And, 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 I, and I was a huge fan of uh, shakes and making, you know, I would try to do berries instead of bananas, but it's still, you know, grinding something down to essentially sugar. So, so I just think all of those talking points are critical. I think intermittent fasting is not required by anybody, but when you do keto, man, it's a good chance that you're not going to be hungry and if you're not hungry, there's no need to eat. So I just, I just, I'm just happy you were able to put all those pieces together. But you have a family also, uh, some of whom I met. So I'm curious how they, you know, perceived you as you started to take on this journey. How did your friends perceive you? Was it kind of like, what are you doing, or was it more, you know, what I'm interested in trying it too? Well, it was interesting because I was in a standard practice. So I had, you know, four partners and they're watching me. They, they go, you're losing weight. What are you doing? I said, well, I'm cutting down my carbs, eating less processed foods, that kind of stuff. And, you know, like, you're not doing that crazy keto thing, right? That low carb. And I'm like, well, kind of, yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of trying to be like diplomatic about it. But then what happened was my part, you know, I got the most heat probably from my partner. Some of the cardiologists in town were saying like, what the heck are you doing with your, these patients? You're putting, you're, you're putting them on a higher fat diet. I'm like, yeah, but look at the risk factors. You know, I was looking at some of the studies of metabolic health and hyperinsulinemia, the high insulin levels. And so when I explained that, I would have to sit and explain it, but it was so much fun because it was actually a, a fun thing because one of my partners was an, and is an endocrinologist. And he thought, this is crazy. And I said, well, why? And he was concerned about people who are on insulin getting low blood sugars. And I said, well, <laughs> what do you do with your patient if they're having breakfast and the, instead of eating, if they can't eat, if they're nauseated that morning, what do you do? It's like, you hold the insulin. I said, okay, what about if at lunch they can't eat? Then you hold the insulin because you're dosing your insulin on how many carbohydrates. And that's what we've always done. So I said, what happens if they get to breakfast and instead of not eating, they eat a bunch of eggs? Then how much insulin do you give them? He said, well, you're not giving them carbs. You don't give them insulin. So I'm like, What's hard about this concept? It's like little kids get this. So if you don't give them sugar, then you don't need insulin to get rid of sugar. You're not getting giving them. And then his answer was, well, it's dangerous because their long acting insulin is going to make them get low sugars. I was like, well, you don't give it to them. You taper it down and get rid of it. And it was such an, a foreign concept. And they, you know, and and when we he he went back to the old journals to to uh, show me that I'm wrong. And then he came in and closed the book and said they did the same thing you're talking about. Like when we go back as, as you know, Osler, or all these, like the godfathers of medicine, before we had insulin, all they did was dietary management. But now all of a sudden it's crazy to do what they used to do before we had the drugs, you know? So yeah, that was, so that was my experience. And my family was actually, you know, when I'm struggling with weight my entire life, when I start losing weight and feeling well and I'm out hiking and doing stuff and, and uh, you know, they, they were very supportive of it because they said, hey, you're, you're looking at the data and I have the data and I had Jason Fung's book and, you know, some other people out there who were doing it, Professor Noakes, Gary Fetke, and saying, well, let's try it. If what we're doing is not working, we have to change our tact. 
You know what? Um, I had this conversation today with a patient who um, was doing really well, ended up being a type 1 diabetic. And I recently had Dr. Keith Runyon on, uh, who was, uh, you know, the nephrologist who also, also, you know, has a A1C of 5 as a type 1 diabetic, right? And, and, I, and I think a lot of times people are so concerned about low sugars, but the logic of, again, I always use the analogy, poison, antidote, and man, just get rid of the poison. You don't need the antidote, right? Especially for a type two. So, and if you're a type one, uh, you you won't need that much insulin. I mean, you know, I have type ones that are like in the eight to twelve range of the long acting insulin. And and uh, so instead of cha- and what happens when you're constantly giving people uh, things that you give them to keep their sugar high is that they're on a roller coaster. And and no matter and no matter what you do on that roller coaster, you will not have the control you want because you're constantly chasing. And the insulin has all these responsibilities that it normally would do physiologically on its own. But when you're just, you know, kind of artificially, exogenously giving yourself insulin, it won't really work as well as your human body was designed to. So so it's best to take a type one or a type two, get them at a level where they're not going up and down, where it's, you know, it's a steak instead of, you know, the, the oatmeal, and then they do much better. So I just think that uh, once you put that in that clinician's head, you would hope that he'll say, aha, hadn't thought about it. Maybe I need to reframe how I think. And my, unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way, but that's what I'm hoping for. So, so yeah, that's, that's, you know how crazy that is. They just don't seem to get it in spite of, Hearing what you just said, you know, so. Yeah, and not only that, it's a, you know, like I, I can absolutely remember my aunt and uncle are sitting at the table, both diabe- diabetic, and they go, oh, we're going to have an extra piece of cake. We just shoot more insulin and that will take care of it. And I'll take a little extra Lipitor and I'll take a little more of my blood pressure medicine. Everything will be fine. It's like, well, that insulin is not making the sugar disappear. It's shoving it somewhere, right? <laughs> you know, and then like you're saying, you get more and more insulin resistant, then you need more and more to get the same effect. Just like right. if someone's drinking every night, they keep drinking more and more. They're they're going to have to keep drinking more and more to get that effect. But if they stop for a month and then they have one drink, they get they get that same effect for a lot less money. That's right. And for anybody that's doing low carb keto or carnivore, yes, you will uh, have a lower tolerance of alcohol. So be careful if you're uh, at the cocktail party and you didn't know that. Uh, you mentioned uh, Professor Tim Noakes, and as we all know, uh, he put something out in the Tritosphere, I think, and you know, I think it was something with keto and and children or something like that. And he, you know, it ended up being this big lawsuit. So. Uh, you know, I know when I listen to a low carb MD podcast, you guys start off by saying this is just for educational purposes, you know, only. That's what I should say about uh, the, the podcast we're entertaining people with today. But, but how do you do you think about the uh, fact that the, the conventional allopathic world is still concerned about keto low carb, and we're out here spreading this message? How much do you lose any sleep at night worried about? the potential that people can come after you? Well, you know, it's always a potential just because there's always people who don't like it. And that's actually why I started the podcast because I said, well, I could either sit here quietly and just do my thing and then I'm a sitting duck target when someone does say something. Or do you say, hey, let's expose everyone who's doing it and say, hey, you're doing low carb in South Africa, you're doing it in in Jamaica, you're doing it over here. So when you see hundreds of doctors doing that, because that's how we change the standard of care. When you have a bunch of doctors saying, here's my data, here's my success. And that's what ultimately Professor Noakes and, and Fetke did was they showed, hey, here's my outcomes. And they both won, but they went through three years of heck. You know, they went through it. So I said, well, if these guys go through it to open the door for us. And, you know, I think it was a big uh, boost for us all when the ADA, American Diabetes Association, finally recognized low carb keto. Now it's all like we're, we're part of the standard care. And, you know, and part of it is when, you know, I always tease Dr. Fetke, when I see him, because his defense should have been, look, the, the food pyramids, it says specifically, this was not designed to treat any medical problem. It's for right. keeping healthy people healthy. Well, healthy people aren't healthy anymore. We don't have, that's only like 6% <laughs> of the population. So what about for the other 94%? That's who we're addressing. If you have diabetes, you're not healthy anymore, right? We, or you're pre-diabetic or whatever it is. So, you know, th- it doesn't really hold um, an argument based on saying, hey, you're not following the food pyramid or you're not following the ADA's recommendation. Well, I'm not following their previous recommendation, but now I'm following their, I am following their recommendation. And that's, yeah. that's, you know, that's 
shown. It's in there. It's part of their guidelines. Yeah, it's really helpful, and I'm really happy it's there. And the you know the Association of Clinical Endocrinology has it in there. The American Heart Association uh, this year got it in there. So we definitely have uh, our legs to stand on. What's the most shocking though is that the clinicians didn't get the memo. It just seems like they didn't get the memo. So we still got a lot of work to do, but at least we can uh, stand on the roof with some other organizations and keep screaming this message. So you also uh, understand, just like I do, that um, the mainstream is focused on calorie. They're still calorie centric. I had a patient today uh, who is doing, you know, had considered, had done Weight Watchers, wasn't successful. We talked about calories versus carbs and why you know, we tend to lean towards the carb approach versus the calorie approach. So, so when you're talking to patients about, you know, calorie centric versus carb centric, what type of messages do you give them to kind of push them towards a more carb focused approach? Yeah. You know, I'm looking at it from a physiologic standpoint. For me, it was insulin resistance. So I was working out with a trainer and he's carb loaded me all day. And I knew it couldn't, I inherently knew this couldn't be right. And I wasn't losing weight. I was strong, but I wasn't losing any weight. And so I said, well, there's gotta be something with this extra, you know, drinking Gatorade four times a day and, you know, adding in all these carbs when you're working out to get your muscles so you could put on muscle mass. I was like, well, shouldn't we be able to do that without, how come these cavemen and people out and, you know, that are chasing animals in Africa, they're, they're in pretty dang good shape. So you start realizing, you know, say, gosh, maybe some of the nutrition advice we were given wasn't correct, you know, because it wasn't working for me. So ultimately, when I started doing low carb, I started seeing people coming off their meds, coming off diabetes meds and insulin and blood pressure meds. I was like, wow, this is pretty amazing because I had in my career up to that point, 14 or 15 years, I'd never seen that. And all of a sudden you see it and you think, wow, they don't need their blood pressure medicine. Now they don't need their their insulin anymore. It's like your sugars are great. Let's stop it. <laughs> like I never thought that that was possible. And you never, and you didn't, you weren't taught it was possible and because we were taught these are chronic progressive diseases and we never saw anybody get off medicine except for a few exceptions. Now, now today we're recording um, and I had two people get off medicine today. I actually did a tweet uh, for those who are watching this episode, go back, you know, it was a, a week before this probably will be released, but it was a couple of patients who came in and they both, one had a creatinine of 1.8 or so, and it's down to 1.2. And the other had one that was like 1.5 down to, you know, one point, I don't know what it was. But, 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 but what I'm saying is when they started this dietary pattern, things just started getting better. And I was always taught that's not possible. And I see it so often. So when I did the tweet, I also tweeted with Dr. Unwin's study where they showed that over seven years the kidney uh, uh, function got better. So uh, it's, it's very uh, frustrating uh, that people are not seeing. That's why we have to keep shouting. But the other thing that was frustrating, I had a patient who came in and it wasn't me frustrated. He was frustrated. He was a big guy. Uh, he swears that he's doing everything I'm telling him until you start to really you know, get into the weeds a little bit and you find out not exactly. He'll say, you know, doc, I, I'm doing everything you say, but I do have a little muffin every once in a while. And it, I, and every once in a while, it started sounding more frequent than, uh, than, than he was suggesting. But he also talked about, he didn't understand why he struggled. And I did, you know, kind of suggest that some people struggle to achieve metabolic health more than others. So when you think about that patient in front of you who's struggling to ch achieve metabolic health, what are there reasons that some people may struggle more than others? Yeah, and I think actually I didn't answer your previous question, you know, about the calories and the the insulin model. Yeah. And you know, we're at war all the time. And you think about it, and you say, okay, look, I mean, one of the biggest things my patients come back to me first, the first visit, they go, look, I know you know Jason Fung. I'm not going to fast. Don't even talk to me about. It. I'm like, don't worry, we're not going to talk about that because your insulin's really high. We have to fix that problem first. So once we lower the insulin down, what they find it all the time, and I know you hear the same, they'll say, gosh, doc, I'm not even hungry anymore. I used to be starving all day, planning my next meal. And so those calories come because you're hungry all the time. And if your sugar, like you said, with oatmeal or bananas and you're putting honey and, you know, having orange juice, your sugars go really high. Insulin goes up, makes them go low. Now you're hungry again. Now you eat chips. Now it goes up. So like you said, you, you lose that stability. If you have a, a big omelet for breakfast with cheese on it or, or avocado, 
you're not hungry for a while. So people just naturally don't snack all day. They wait and they're, they're and so the calories do go down. You're not going to lose weight by eating 20,000 calories a day. It's not going to happen. So calories do play a role, but we're really focusing on the metabolic part of it. And once we get someone so that we can run on our own fat stores, we don't have to eat all the time. And so that's, it's a really, that's something I had to come to terms with is how could someone be 400 pounds and be hungry all the time? Mm -hmm. Because it's like having a full tank and you're just like, I'm running out of gas. How could you possibly run out of gas when your tanks are, you have five gas tanks on you and you realize you just can't get to your fuel source because of the, the hormonal problems, the high insulin. And so once you lower the insulin down and people can get to their gas stores, they can get to the bank to get money. They don't need to have a bunch of cash on them anymore, right? They don't have to be eating all the time. So that's why it's fun to see that when people say, oh my goodness, I'm free of this bond that I've had, this bondage. And, the, and it's really, it's like they're free from being tormented all day long thinking about what they're going to eat next. Because at my old office, the, the medical assistants would be planning their whole breakfast, lunch, snack, dinner. Like everything was planned in the morning. They sit there while they're eating their donuts, right? Because they're hungry all day long. <laughs> And so say, yeah, I'm not really hungry. I don't eat till dinner time. People say, what? How can you possibly do that? I would be dead. You know, it's amazing. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I, I see that all the times. And uh, it is, um, you know, I, you know I, I know my team. It's a struggle. So I know it's hard for some people. But in that work environment, man, it's just uh, too many things to celebrate. I'm in a building with over 130 or so, uh, you know, docs, associates, and uh, we're celebrating some, you know, every week. So with that mindset and with the idea that Dunkin' Donuts is right across the street, it's easy to just, you know, have donuts in front of you and who knows what's in the coffee. So, so yeah, getting back to that question about a, a large person, a person who's uh, struggling to, uh, you know, maybe lose weight or to achieve metabolic health when the, maybe their spouse is, is like a piece of cake, right? And we see that a lot when men and women compare each other's. Anything that comes to mind that would explain why some people struggle, why others don't? Yeah, there's so much to that. That's that we, we, we can unpack that for a couple hours, really. And that's been my dilemma of figuring out what I find the biggest correlation I see, high stress, not sleeping right? Menopausal, like hormonal stuff. All those things play a role for sure. And it depends how much muscle mass you had. It may depend on how much you weighed as a kid where you fit your whole life and then you just chose bad habits. Those people do really, really well. But some people have been obese since they were born and then it's been a family. And, and so uh, the other thing is how much we, we attribute uh, food for celebration. Like you said, you're either celebrating someone's birthday or it's, you know, the wedding or whatever. And so, so much of our life revolves around that and it's a social thing. So my Italian patients, for instance, it's hard because they're used to getting these big dinners and everyone's making bread and pasta and they show their love by bringing the biggest dessert and, you know, shoving it down. And so it's hard because there's cultural aspects to it. There's emotional, there's, there's true food addiction where some people, I just, you know, I have a, a lady today I'm trying to help that's, she has a, uh, like a dysphoria before her period. So for two weeks, she binges like crazy. And she, mm -hmm. she goes, it doesn't matter how full I am. I'm still going to eat. I just, I, I just can't get enough. And then the two weeks after she's working hard and back, uh, back on track. And then she's, the poor thing is going through this in her entire life. So we're trying to intervene to see how do we fix that problem? Because the, the pool of food and, and the more, uh, uh, hyper palatable that food is right the more cookies and donuts and cakes and french fries you get such a, a dopamine reward from that that you crave more of that so most people aren't going to keep eating steak until they throw up they eat enough they go i'm full i'm done they won't keep eating it all night hopefully you know for the most part but there are some people with pathology from that standpoint and i think really when people are motivated say look i got diabetes i'm scared i want to get healthy tell me what to do and i'm on track other people are thinking, do I have to give up cookies and donuts if I want, if I could just have one? And, you know, and it, and it really varies. What I've learned really is that there's some people who are, they have to be abstinent mm -hmm. because if they have one low carb cookie, they go off the rails for six months. And other people can say, hey, I can have, you know, like just with alcohol, some people say I have one or two drinks and it's not my thing and I'm done. But other people have one drink. And once they do that first sip, they're done. Like they'll yell at everyone, tell them they want more drinks. So I think we have to learn for ourselves, you know, what matters and, and, you know, are we that person who has to just say, I can't eat any of that stuff. I just have to, if I mess up, I can't get back on track, but some people can say, Hey, as long as I can have a piece of pizza every two months, I'm fine. Okay. That works for you. You know? So it's really figuring out that balance of not being too restrictive for people who don't need it and, and not being too lenient on people who need to be right. more strict. Yeah. It's, it's really for us to figure out as clinicians.
Yeah, we have to we have to problem solve and and that's what I attempted to do with this patient today. You know, what what is it that is his barrier? One of the reasons why I have this uh, nest and rope acronym is that it's uh, you know, I can kind of walk down those uh, letters and say, "Okay, let's how's the relationship going? You know, uh, are you getting your sleep? What's going on with your stress?" You know, uh, you know, are you, you know, in the right, are you doing the self-limiting thinking, you know, the thinking part? So we try to walk through that and you basically have to be a problem solver. And I think for this particular patient, uh, you know, he was kind of cheating in certain areas. So he, he has discipline. I don't have, think he has a process with addiction, but I do think that he, he needs to be nearly a keto for meaning, you know, maybe he needs to get his carbs even less than where it's at. And he likes animals, so that shouldn't be a struggle. And I think that once he gets disciplined and kind of gets a little bit more restrictive, he'll be fine. But but we but you have to be a problem solver for everybody listening, watching, uh, really start to look backwards and say, where am I? What could potentially be the reason why I'm struggling? Even if you have to start with that nest and rope acronym and start try to put that together. If you're in a dysfunctional relationship, that's going to create stress and you're going to struggle to achieve your goals. So just kind of think it through. And then when you come to your clinician, maybe they have resources that'll help you uh, to achieve your goals. One of the things I try to do when patients come see me is, you know, kind of look at their metabolic health. I try not to be obsessed with the scale. I try to, you know, look at those things that we measure to determine, is this person technically metabolically healthy or not? I could care less where the, where the scale ends. I just want that to happen. So what, what kind of tips would you give a, a, a person who's watching who may have a doctor or a clinician willing to order these labs, what kind of labs would you suggest they start thinking about, you know, as they uh, work towards metabolic health? Well, for me, I think the most critical for me is, is it getting a fasting insulin. A lot of my patients are cash pay for their labs or, you know, they'll have a high deductible. So I try to be as focused as I can initially. So I generally, unless people are really concerned or have symptoms, I, I stay away from hormones and checking all that stuff, you know, definitely get a thyroid panel and make sure it's not a thyroid problem that we're, that everyone's missed down the, you know, going back. But uh, fasting insulin, three months sugar average and a lipid panel are extremely helpful because we see trends, you know, if you're eating a ton of carbohydrates, you know, as a matter of fact, I, I, one of my patients who, who has a great story in his, himself, uh, who's really turned his life around, he was a, he was, well, when he came in, he was 320 pounds. And now he brought his friend in who makes him look like a dwarf next to him. When I see him, I was like, holy cow. But this guy, he wanted to introduce him to me and tell me, tell, explain to him what he, what he was doing. And his triglycerides are 826. I'm like, just seeing that number, I know you're metabolically sick, right? Before I see anything else. And then his his insulin has never been checked. His his A1C is 6.4, doctor. And they said, well, don't worry. Once you get diabetes, we'll start treating it. You don't have to make any changes and we'll see what happens. And but I watched the trend just looking at his lab history went from 5.4 to 5.6 to 6.0 to 6.3 to 6.4. And no one's concerned about this. No one's talking to him about lifestyle changes, or maybe you shouldn't be drinking that iced tea every day. So, you know, those kind of things that is when you see the labs, you can predict what's coming. And Ben Bickman did a great job from BYU of having a graph that I show all my patients that your three month sugar average and sugar could stay stable for 10 years. But that whole time, the insulin's creeping up and creeping up and creeping up. And at some point, you can't keep up anymore. And then, boom, you got diabetes. It didn't just happen today, you know, type 2 diabetes. I'm, specifically talking about it, it it builds up over time so we can predict what's coming so i have so many patients that i predicted uh oh here's what's coming like we see the train going towards the cliff we know you're going to go off the cliff sooner or later so you got to either change course <laughs> and do things different maybe it's what like you said uh, that's why i love the nest is watching your stress get your exercise activity getting your thinking right don't be stressed all the time all these things are a factor Right. It's not just what you're eating. And, and I think that's a huge, huge, huge point. You know, and, and sometimes it's just not the right time. If you're going through a divorce, or you just got fired from your job and you're it may not be the time to change your lifestyle. You know, you may not be ready and you may not have the resources and you're set up for failure. Sometimes you say, let's get things stabilized. You know, let's not try it right during the holidays. Maybe, you know, in the beginning of the year we try or I've had some people start during the holidays. They go, I'm, I'm serious. I'm in. And they crushed it. You know, and so they're not starting with a 20 pound extra that they have to lose. They're, 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 they've, they've been proactive thinking ahead because all of us think January 1st and we'll go next January, we'll do it. I'll do it in March when I'm after the holidays, you know? So it's, it's just really getting on track and doing it, you know? Yeah. And I like, I like the way you're framing the conversation and meet people where they are. 
if you struggle, you should struggle during the holidays. You should struggle because you just lost a family member. You should struggle because your marriage is dysfunctional. So, and it's okay to struggle. How? Let's focus on that for a little bit first, because what I found is that you're not going to be successful with low carb keto kind of, or anything close to that if you don't deal with those issues first. So I think that's really important. And, and, and I think our goal is to like literally not just problem solve why somebody is not losing weight, but just problem solve, look at the big, the whole person, not just the numbers in the lab. And I do agree with you that fasting insulin is gold. So if anybody's not had a fasting insulin, I would encourage you to ask your clinician to get that because it will predict diabetes five to 10 years in advance. I mean, that's like go. And then of course, the other test is predicting a heart attack, which is the uh, the uh, calcium score test, which is a, a great way. And even the Heart Association is finally saying it's probably the best screening test. And in our health system is 50 bucks. So for $50, you don't just get your calcium score, the arteries around your heart looked at, you also look at the whole chest. So I've seen aneurysms and all kinds of stuff. That's the, that's the most return on investment of any test I can think of uh, in the health system. So, so now in order to um, achieve metabolic health, it sounds like you, you spend time talking to your patients about ways to do that. But when you start your, like I have my link tree with my handout, right? So I say, you know, eat this, not that. One side, eat. The other side, avoid or don't eat. How do you approach your patients um, beyond getting those labs? What I mean, because you, I mean, you probably have more time than I do. I'm assuming because of the type of practice you have. But so, what do they walk away with? How much? I mean, you have so much knowledge about this. You know, where do you start? Right? Yeah, so that's you know, that. That's the challenge, right? Because I could dump a lot of knowledge, and then the person sitting there thinking it's like the first day of class, and you get the whole syllabus for the the whole semester, and you're thinking, "Oh my goodness, you're overwhelmed and stressed out." And I don't want to cause people to be more stressed. So really, it's meeting people where they are and saying, "Okay, for instance, if you want to run a if you want to run a marathon, okay, if you want to run it next month, it's going to be rough. But if you want to do it for in a year or two, okay, we could work slowly towards that, and you don't have to quit your job and train full time." It's the same thing. It's like, what are your goals? If you say, hey, I just want to be able to get down and play with my grandkids. I don't need six pack abs. I don't need, you know, so not, it's not about the weight loss. And I love that you said that because that is the key is saying, look, our goal is metabolic health. So if your A1C goes from 6.4 to 5.8, I would, I would rather have that than losing 80 pounds, right? When you start seeing from a metabolic and what those implications are down the road for hypertension and, and dementia and Parkinson's and all those things, you say, gosh, because there's people, as you know, there are people who are thin, they look healthy, and you get their labs and think, oh, no, this is a train wreck waiting to, ha waiting to happen. So you can. I've seen people that were 400 pounds that have normal labs, right? It, because they're, they're storing it in their subcutaneous, not in the visceral fat. So that's the big one we worry about is the visceral fat, the fat around the organs. And so the good news and the bad news, the good news is that's the first to go because it's the most dangerous, the most pro-inflammatory. Um, but... It, the, the reason that's bad news is the love handles are going to hang around for a while, the, the external fat. So you have to burn those. So those of us like me who has a lot of visceral fat, I have to burn through that. So I can't just lose 40 pounds right away, you know? And so people have to understand that. It's like some people are just not going to lose it as quick. As a matter of fact, the guy who brought his friend in, I was telling you about, he comes in with his wife. He's 320 pounds. She's 158 pounds. So the first meeting I sat down, she was there to support him. And I told her, look, don't, I, I was mostly talking to her, don't get frustrated. He's going to lose a ton of weight really quickly. And you're not, and you're going to get frustrated and think it's not working, but just be patient and it's going to come. You just have to be patient. So the first week they come back and I have a continuous glucose monitor. And initially his sugars are 260, 270. Within three or four weeks, his sugars are running in the hundreds, right? So he's dramatically improving. I'm looking at his sugar logs. I'm seeing what he's doing. But in the first week they come back, the wife lost 4.8 pounds. He lost 0.6 pounds. <laughs> I'm like, that's weird. Okay, let's go to the next week. She loses three pounds. He loses 0.8 pounds. I'm like, this is wow. So he had a total at on a 320 pounds. He lost four pounds. And by that time, she had lost like 22 pounds, right, on a smaller frame. But he had a ton of visceral fat, and she had no visceral fat. So she was losing subcutaneous fat very quickly, and he's burning through all that visceral fat. And that's what I learned. And he goes, doc, I know I only lost four pounds, <laughs> four pounds, but look at my shirt. His clothes are loose on him. He goes, my pants are falling off. The wife goes, I can hug around his waist already. I'm like on four pounds on a 320 pound guy. Now he's 316. I don't think so. But when I started looking at the data and go, wow, look, his insulin, everything got better. 
So what he was doing was losing this visceral fat. And as you lose, and this is why the scale is so important. As you lose visceral fat, you naturally put on muscle mass. So he was putting on muscle at the same rate, basically, that he was losing fat. So it wasn't showing up on the scale, but on him, it was showing up. So that's what my patients, I'll tease them sometimes when they're frustrated that they're not losing weight. I'm like, you've just lost six inches off your waist. Are your friends looking at you or do they get on the scale with you? Because <laughs> they're seeing you and they're saying you look great and you're feeling great and you're worried about the scale. And so a lot of people, they're, they're going to give up too quickly because they're not seeing them. They go, I didn't lose 30 pounds in the first week. I'm done. So now that guy's dragging his friend in because he's reversed his diabetes. He's got his sugars under. He's, his blood pressure was tanking. We had to get him off all of his blood pressure medicines. And he's explained this to his friends, his friend who's on all these meds. He goes, you can come off them. And his friend says, my doctor said I'll never come off these medicines. I'm like, I'll bet your doctor wrong. I'll be glad to prove him wrong for sure. You know, so it's fun when people start getting results. But that guy, when he only lost four pounds, he could have said, forget it, I'm done and walked away. You know, said this is a, a scam. It's not working. But showing him the data, showing him what we're talking about and showing his visceral fat coming down like crazy, his muscle mass going up because I have a scale that can do that. I'm pretty fortunate that way. And also looking at his continuous glucose monitor. So. I have a lot of tools at my disposal, which can keep you motivated when you want to give up. It also uh, helps us problem solve. So when I asked that earlier question, why some people lose weight and some people don't, well, maybe they actually did, but it, it was done in the way you just described, where they got a little muscle, they did lose fat, maybe it was visceral fat in the beginning, maybe that made it harder, but all of that makes sense. So I think it's nice to problem solve. And that's why these podcasts are so helpful because somebody listening may be like, oh, that could be me or that mm -hmm. could be my wife. And I think that's really important. Another thing you mentioned that I think you, you may want to comment on what you talked about at the symposium because I was at that lecture as well. And, and one of the things you talked about was the microbiome. And um, during that conversation, even during my functional medicine training, we, we learned a lot about you know, bacteroides, firmicutes, some bacteria make you gain weight, some make you, you know, lose weight. In other words, some bacteria just hold on to the energy in the food more and that person's going to gain weight. So any reflection on your talk at the symposium, uh, just, you know, rather it's the microbiome or any other talking points you made during that talk. Yeah, the microbiome was fascinating and something that I always heard leaky gut. You hear all these things. You think this is all crazy, you know, functional medicine that I don't understand. All you got to do is, you know, exercise more type thing. But it's really interesting when you look at the microbiome. If, if you put processed food and garbage in, you get bad microbiome. If you're stressed all the time, you get bad microbiome. If you take antibiotics every week, you get bad microbiome. So you start realizing there's a lot of things. I have people that... One of my patients is a, a lifetime you know, police officer, fit, healthy, great. And then all of a sudden, she's gained 80 pounds. I'm like, How, what happened? Either it was a life trauma, she went through a divorce, something traumatic happened on the, in the line, you know, something happened to her. And it turns out she had a stomach infection. They put her on antibiotics for a month. And after that, she starts gaining weight. So I'm like, wow, okay. Like all of a sudden, you didn't change your genetics. Nothing else changed except probably your gut microbiome. So we worked hard with her saying, let's, let's do more kefir, let's get, you know, yogurt. And- I'm telling you, the more I learned about it, the more I think, what do you do to fix it? You know, what you can do is watch your stress, get enough sleep, don't hate the world, you know, those kind of things that we're talking about anyways from a metabolic standpoint. But what's interesting is hormonal changes in your body will affect the, the gut microbiome. So if your stress hormones, cortisol really high, for instance, also cortisol being high all the time with stress can affect the conversion of, of the inactive to the active thyroid hormone. So some people, we keep giving them the old one, they can't convert it over and it's not helping them. But their TSH goes down. We say, oh, well, it's not your thyroid, but we, we're not checking any of their numbers to see. So, yeah, the, the microbiome is absolutely fascinating. And I think we're going to learn a lot about how, for instance, artificial sweeteners like can affect the gut microbiome. So in our community, everyone's talking about, well, does artificial sweetener spike the sugars or does it, does it spike the insulin levels? And it may not have that effect. It may be just on the effect on the gut microbiome. So I've had people change their gut microbiome and, and I think, and we've, we, you know, we know carnivores who stopped eating processed food and all of a sudden the, all their abdominal pain goes away and their mood gets better and all these other, their joint pains go away. So could it be that they're getting their microbiome healthier, more fit? And if what they're eating makes them less stressed, maybe that less stress, the hormones aren't messing up your microbiome because it, it's a, it's a two way communication, right? They're mm -hmm. communicating back and forth all the time. So if your microbiome is telling you like candida, for instance, if it's telling you you're hungry all the time to eat more sugar because it wants you to give it more sugar so it can get bigger, 
then maybe you, you need to get rid of that candida somehow. So it's not sending those signals to your brain that you're star you're starving all the time. And, you know, high triglycerides can make you more hungry. There's so many things that, that can interfere. So I think that is an area we're going to learn a heck of a lot more in what we're doing in our type of medicine and say, let's look at that. There, and there's people, Sabine Hazen is someone in, in California who I learned a lot from. And she's, uh, she's really doing well with looking at the microbiome and figuring out, Oh, if you're missing the phytobacteria, you're, you're way more likely to die of infections. If you're missing this one, you're more likely to be obese. And so the problem is, how do we fix that? You know, how do you, do you can you just take that probiotic? Well, there's a balancing act too. So if you give too much of one, it might affect, you know, it's a complicated system. So as long as you say, okay, what can I do? I could watch my stress and do all these other things, eat healthier food and not, and you know, alcohol kills the microbiome too. It's like, oh. And maybe that's part of the reason why when people drink too much, they start getting all these other mental problems and, and abdominal pain and bloating and all that. So you say, oh, you know, as a matter of fact, I'll tell you, I, didn't, I don't know if I told you at the conference, but the first night I gave my talk, you know, and so I said, well, it was, they were having wine tasting. It was low carb wines. So I'll have a couple of glasses of wine. You know, I'm here visiting with you and everyone else. So I have a couple of glasses of wine. When I looked at my whoop, which is, it, it's a, it's like a aura ring. The next day, my recovery was, it, I only had a couple of glasses of wine, but my recovery was terrible, even though I slept more than I generally do. I was like, wow, that's crazy. So the rest of the conference, I didn't have anything until the last night we had a dinner and I had a couple of glasses of wine, slept a little bit more than usual the next morning. Recovery was terrible. You go, wow, there's something, you know, heart rate variability and all these markers. So that's one of the things that people say, well, I'm low carb, but I drink five glasses of wine at night. It's like, that's a problem. <laughs> it, yeah. It's not the carbohydrate. It's the alcohol effect, you know, on the that's microbiome, right. but also on your hormones. So all these things we start looking at saying, well, okay, how do I live the healthiest life I can? So maybe, you know, for some people maybe saying, okay, if you're drinking every night, can we go to every other night to start? You know, I'm not saying you have to quit today and that's it. But sometimes you say, can you just have it on the weekends and not have it, have less or, you know, whatever you try to figure out what works for them as a person. And then we try to yeah. tailor that, you know? Yeah. And it's, uh, it's interesting, uh, this alcohol thing. One thing I've learned, uh, as I've, uh, taken my functional medicine, uh, tour and, uh, training is man, alcohol is a toxin. So if you put alcohol in your body, it's going to stop doing a whole lot of other important things to detoxify you. So, so yeah, I mean, we, we say it's okay to have alcohol, but I think the less you consume it and you save it for those special moments because you're at, you know, uh, uh, you know, a conference or something, you just want to enjoy that one day. That's okay. But if this is a regular thing, uh, you may be able to get through it, but it's gonna it's gonna compromise a lot of things. So I I'm, I'm I'm you know for me my tolerance is not there, so I can't you know if I drink too much alcohol, you'll see it. I'm a Gemini, so you may see that other side of my Gemini. <laughs> but um, so I'm trying not to go there, and I just think people have to be honest and assess how they respond. I'm sure some people's uh, metabolism works in such a way they can tolerate it better, but in general, when you have those tools to monitor and to see what's happening. It gives you an honest assessment. I think those are really important. I was yeah. always, yeah. And, and especially also if you are low carb, strict keto and low carb, when you drink alcohol, it's going to drop your sugars because your liver is always kicking out sugar. So your sugar, your body's running on the fat stores for a while, right? And if you give it alcohol, it says, oh, I got to get rid of this, this poison. And it stops making sugar for a while. Then your sugars yeah. will drop. And I've had that personally happen to me when my sugars drop, like, dramatically just from having a couple of glass of wine and eating, you know, uh, some salmon or something, you know, after working out and my muscles are still soaking up some of that sugar. And so, you know, those kind of things can happen too in the low carb community. The other thing I'll, I'll throw in there with alcohol since we're on this kick is the other thing that I see happening because I monitor my patients with continuous glucose monitor. So I'll see hmm, their sugar start dropping down a little bit. And then all of a sudden, boom, their sugars go crazy. And I'll say, huh. And there are a couple, I go, don't tell me. You were out with friends and you just had to have a couple of drinks. And then you said, you know what? We're out. We're going to have fun tonight. And your inhibition goes down, right? Yeah. We all make bad choices. So people are more likely to have French fries and Coke and whatever. And then they go, okay, I'll, I'll start again tomorrow morning. And then the next morning, their sugars are low and messed up. So I could tell when, and it's funny because that happens and we see it, you know, as, as a yeah. couple saying, okay, we'll just take one night off. And then one couple, one, one, one partner can get back on track. The other one struggles for four or five days, you know? Right. So That's it's right. all those things. It, it plays a role. Well, you know, speaking of partners, um, I see those beautiful images in the background for oh, those yeah. who are on YouTube, right? So it looks like that's you and the, and the lady. And But you have another partner, and that's Dr. Tro, right? So yeah. how, how did you guys connect and become buddies in this low carb thing? What's crazy is I was looking, well, what happened is it, it's funny how life works out, but I was 
kind of starting out in this realm and I was doing a, a free talk, a seminar for low carb and keto here in San Diego. Happens to be Brett Scher, who's now with Diet Doctor. I, I reached out to him because he's a cardiologist, gives me some credibility. Uh, a couple other people joined me. And uh, so we give a talk and uh, I, I wanted to, to get people there so I could really have a bigger crowd. So I put it on uh, the two keto dudes. I said, hey, can I put something in your thing that I'm doing this in case there's people in San Diego that want to come? And the first question they asked, are you selling ketones? I'm like, no, I'm not. because people were marketing themselves. I go, no, I'm not marketing. I'm not charging for this. And they said, well, just come on and talk about what you're doing. We've heard about you a little bit. And I'm like, okay. So I come on, I do my talk and I, and then uh, afterwards they said, you know, you should do your own. We need a doctor doing this stuff. You should do your own podcast. I'm like, ah, I'm not like a really outspoken, like, you know, person. <laughs> I, I know it's it's hard. I, I, honestly, my nature is not that way. I know it's kind of crazy, but people who know me know I'm very quiet. My wife teases me. She goes, "Before keto, you were pretty quiet and reserved." And now I get when you get passionate about something, you, like you know, we've all seen the amputations and the blindness and the dialysis. Go, gosh, this is preventable. So you, you want to shout it from the rooftops. Yeah. So I wanted to shout it from the rooftops, but I go, I'm not the messenger. People get bored with me pretty quick. So I go, I need someone who's kind of, you know, a different personality than me. So who's more different than me is Tro. He's a New Yorker, loud, brash, you know, shoots from the hip. You know, he's not afraid to use the F word. And hey, I'm pretty reserved from that standpoint. So I was like, oh. so I, so, so I reached out to him. I go, Hey, I see you're not doing it. And his story is great. He's like, he used to be 350 pounds. He's lost all this weight and he, he knows what he's doing. And the reason, you know, and I thought, oh, gosh, I had a, kind of had a check about it. I was looking at his tweets. I go, man, he's confrontational. He fights with people, but that's the New York way. But I saw one tweet where he said, you know, I was, he, and he, he was just being honest and he said, I was running on the treadmill the other day. And uh, there was two guys behind me and they were like, that guy is so fat. What's he been doing here? He's wasting his time. He's never going to be in shape. And he like, and he goes, oh, I was so ashamed. I wanted to leave the gym. And then he realized, you know, he, he had lost 150 pounds. And he goes, wow. they're not talking about me. But then I said, that's the guy I want because he gets it because I get it too. I understand how it is when you can't. And he talked about how he couldn't fasten the seatbelt when he got on the plane and all that. I go, that's the guy who gets it. I want him. Like, So I reached out to him and we kind of hit it off. And then we started doing stuff. And I reached, <laughs> I said, look, if we're going to get a podcast off the ground, we need Jason Fung to at least come. So I called Jason. I go, hey, would you would you consider coming on as a guest? And he was, he's taken off like crazy. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I'll come on, Brian. Then he email me goes yeah i want to collaborate with you guys i want to be part of it i'm like really so luckily we had jason join us and help us get off the ground and all that kind of stuff but um but that's kind of how it started you know and, and uh you know it's just funny how it, how it is and and you know he's been a huge mentor to me and i've been a huge mentor to him because i'm older and probably have more world experience and life experience about hey uh tone it down a little bit so i had to have a talk with him i said you gotta tone it down i want kids to be able to listen to this and if you're using the f word it's not going to work you know and so you know, so those kind of things. So we kind of, and it's kind of a joke because if they ever cuss on the podcast, we always bleep it. And people are like, why are you guys bleeping it? We're adults. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm trying to like, you know, I want it to be, you know, where, where people can share it with their grandma and not be ashamed, you know? Yeah. Well, that, that's actually, that leapfrogged into the next thing that came to my mind is contrasting the difference between a low carb MD podcast and life best medicines podcast. So when you started life best medicine, what was your purpose of having a completely separate uh, podcast? I wanted to get you on again, man. I had to have somewhere <laughs> else to host you. No, really what happened is low carb MD people want to hear about low carb. So what happened is we started getting guests that were, you know, maybe they would talk about their faith and how faith got them through. And so, I, you know, as a person of faith, I said, hey, you know, and we would get into a little discussion and people would criticize me and say, we don't want to hear about faith. We don't want to hear about that. We want to hear about low carb. You're you're ruining. But I was like, I was making the points like you don't realize it's not just low carb. It's how you treat your your family and how it is when you're having times of stress or when you're down in the dumps. And also, I wanted people to know people like you and your life story, because you're just a celebrity or you're just a the person they listen to and they go, you're a doctor they respect. But when you say, Hey, I went through hard times. Here's what, what my life experience was. So I wanted to share behind the curtains and some of the greatest discussions ever showed up. Cause I've had Gary Fetke on Tim Noakes to talk about human and being married. And you know, the one thing I, I see is, and, and that's why I'm excited to have you both on is the power of being in a happy marriage, the power of having support at home to say, Hey, I, I believe in you let's move forward having someone that you love and, and where do you go when everything's down and you have to, you know, when I stepped out of my career, you know, my, my successful, uh, uh, standard medicine and went on my own, people thought I was nuts. My friends, mm -hmm. my partners are looking at me like, are you kidding me? You're going to take a 
you know, 50% pay cut at least. And you're going to be struggling. I was like, if I could be home with my wife and kids at night, it's worth it. So life's best medicine is really saying what really matters to you. What drives you, Tony, to get up? What, you know, when you hear Sean Baker's story, it's amazing. I mean, when you, when you hear the backstory to some of these people and you understand why they are the way they are, like Tro, why is he the way he is? Why is he? And, and in New York, that's just the way it is. But why is Jason Fung so reserved? And why is he not talking? You know, it's hard for him to talk about his wife and kids and family because he's a scientist and he wants to, he wants to stay there. And so. That's what I love is behind the scenes to have Dr. Un went on to tell his story of what he went through. And Dr. Fetke, when his, you know, the thing is his wife got him through all that stuff and she was the the strength behind him and faith and all these other things that it's not just about what we're eating. And that's why I started Life's Best Medicine to be able to say, and, and the other thing was, and I don't want to offend anyone, but basically what would happen on low carb MD, I said something about, I said, have faith and hope. Like when, when we were going through COVID, I said, have faith and hope and think there'll be a better day. And I got attacked for like three days from atheists mm -hmm. saying, Hey, how can you say that? How do you know there's going to be a better day? I'm like, there always is at some point. Now I proved myself right. But I also, and they would argue and say, prove your faith. I'm like, well, I can't really prove it, but I can bring on people and tell their testimony. Just like with low carb, when people see it, you know, those testimonies are powerful. Those people that you've helped along the way, right? Like triple J, like how many people has he touched? Right. So, you know, you start realizing, man, I mean, we're just a conduit and we're, we're there to bring people stories and so many great stories. I mean, some great stories that never would be told. And we have the opportunity to have a platform to, to share it, you know, and what you're doing, obviously. Yeah, I love it. Uh, I just had a, a patient. You know, what's really interesting. I keep saying I just had a patient today. Literally, this is one day. <laughs> I probably had seven or eight success stories uh, where they lost. I think the range of weight loss at, since the beginning of the year was 15 to 35 pounds. It's been like seven to eight people just today. And I, I didn't have a full clinic. It's just, it's amazing. But I did have a patient who was being successful, not as dramatically and I was like, man, your A1C is going down. Your blood pressure was like 120 over 70. It used to be in the 160s. And he just lost his wife. I'm like, how in the, you're still doing this. And I'm like, what, it, what was it? I know we talked. I know I gave you some advice. But most people struggle and are not able to stay on the path. And he said, going back to the faith concept, he said, you know what? You recommended that book. And I was like, what book? You know, Dr. Jason Fong's book? No, no, not that book. <laughs> it was The Shack. Uh, yeah. That, yeah, that book, The Shack. Um, for anybody that's never listened uh, or read that book, uh, is a perfect book, in my opinion, uh, for anybody who has a loss and is trying to understand what that loss means, right? And he read that book and he said it was that book that got him over the hump and he was able to kind of walk away from this loss of a woman he's been with literally since he was you know a young man uh and he was he embraced it in a way that he couldn't have if he hadn't read that book so so what i'm learning that if i'm going to help people i have to provide literally when i was at the symposium for metabolic health and we got to the question and answer i every time they ask a question i'm trying to refer them to a resource you need to go to the diet doctor for this you need to go to the society of metabolic health for that and and i think we have to provide resources and then you hope that those resources will uh, meet people when they need it at the right time so uh, and if it wasn't for me understanding that, I would have not taken the time to share a resource and he probably would have, wouldn't have had the success he has. So I think the fact that you've created a podcast that's going to kind of, you know, peel the onion of these so-called, you know, scientists, doctors, influencers, and help us see them as human, right? Because sometimes people lift, uh, lift you up and you're just a human, uh, and even going to the, uh, when I, I remember the first time I saw you and it was the year before at the, uh, low carb USA conference. And, and, and these are like celebrities, but if you just, you know, break keto bread with them, right. You'll realize, you know what, they're just people, you know? And I think everybody needs to understand that so that they'll understand their struggle is like the struggle of many. So all of that is wonderful. And I really appreciate you sharing that. I do want to kind of, you know, uh, share just maybe, you know, if you were to, if you have somebody in front of you and they're, they're like, Doc, what's the, what's the most important thing I need to do to be successful? What, what would you say to a patient who's like, Doc, I just need to know the, what's that one thing I need to do? What would you say to them? 
Yeah, you know, that that's a complex answer and it depends on the person really, but I think really I think the thing that you provide and you know, I just want to say this too is that you provide hope. You provide hope. That's what we provide is if you can hope and you can say, Hey, look, I do want this. I really like, why do you want to do it? What, what's your, why, you know, it sounds so silly, but it's saying, gosh, it, because when things are hard, when you say like you and I went through that wanting to be a doctor, like there was a lot of times you're, you're going to miss Christmas and you're going to be working and you got all this time. Like, is it worth it at some point? So at some point you have to say, is it worth it to the, and, and one of my favorite patients, as a matter of fact, she's done so well but she came to me and her friend is gung-ho i'm doing this i'm all in i'm not gonna nothing's gonna knock me off track and she struggled the other one came in and goes the first meeting and she says and she happens to be well off and she lives in the bay area and and she said uh, uh look is it a is it a deal breaker i'm gonna have sourdough bread sometimes or a glass of wine and all those things are you gonna be mad at me and i'm gonna have to deal with them I'm like why, why do you like this is our first date and you're trying to cheat on me already why is that and she said, I know myself, I could eat glass for a month if I had to. I know I could starve myself for a month and I could do a liquid diet for a month. But on day 31, I'm eating everything again. I lose my mind. And if I'm too restrictive, it doesn't work for me. Right. And so she and she killed it. I mean, the only time her sugars go up is when she's exercising and she's done so well. And over time, she didn't need those things. She goes, yeah. I just, and so what I love is I'm like, I thought you were going to be having sourdough bread all the time and all these things. And she said, I look at everything and say, is it worth it? You know, and I think if you have that mindset, you go, this isn't it worth it because some people, for instance, that donut sitting there and they go, okay, I'm just gonna have a little piece and that's it. And then they can't stop and they eat the whole thing and then they eat the whole good dozen. And other people will say, yeah, you know, I feel terrible. And I, when you see it for what it is and you go, it's not worth it. I feel bad. I'm bloated. I don't feel well. My sugars go up. I don't like to see my CGM go up, continuous glucose monitor. It's not worth it. And then they make that decision. So I think when you have the power to make that decision and say, no, I'm, I'm in, I'm not going to do all this crazy stuff. And, and so those are the people I find that are very successful saying, hey, just believe in yourself, trust the process and be patient. <laughs> trust it. And we'll get you through that. But there's going to be days you want to quit, but here's what keeps you going, right? Yeah. And that's because they're human. And so, and I love that answer. So uh, just, just, you know, it reminds me of uh, Dr. David Unwin, his grin and Dr. Jen Unwin's acronym, you know, goals, you know, what's your why? What's your why? And, and I just love that. So thank you for that. And let's think about your your next 12 months, the nest and the rope. When you think about what you're going to focus on over the next 12 months, do you have any areas that you want to give a little extra attention? Yeah, for me, really, it's, it's I'm really trying to, I haven't figured out the sleep problem, right? I sleep, I go right to sleep, but I tend to stay up with my wife and we're talking or reading or watching TV or something. I'm like, man, I want to get those eight hours. So it's funny, I've been sabotaged. The other night I was, I was going to get my eight hours and my daughter came in and she was talking and excited about something. And so the next morning I had seven hours and 55 minutes. I'm like, man, I haven't had eight hours of sleep in a long time. I almost made it, but you messed me up. You know, I was teasing her a little bit. But, you know, obviously those times with family are really important. So that's one thing is looking at, at getting enough rest and not, maybe saying no to some things and not speaking at different places and traveling and all those things and really focusing on my health. And then exercise activity is is really, I've been really, you know, looking at that and saying, how, how do I maximize my activity time? Like, you know, doing weight bearing exercise and zone two training and figuring out, you know, I go for bike rides with my buddy on the weekend. So just really being consistent with that and making that a priority of saying, okay, those are the two things because nutrition wise, I do that. You know, I, if I look like you, I could just chill and not have to do a lot of work, but you know, some of us just have, you just have to work harder and you have to say, okay, what works and what doesn't work? What do I change? And, and just changing little variables here and there. And those are the, the two variables I haven't had a great grasp on yet but i'm working on it and i'm getting there yeah and i love that and i and i agree i've never had a weight problem but i had an irritable bowel problem so what you can't see <laughs> so what keeps me kind of disciplined is i want to keep my stomach happy but i agree we all have our own journey and although we can model ourselves after others to a certain extent i think it's important that we uh, honor our own path so you know i'm very excited about this uh I can't wait to do uh, Best Life Medicine with my wife. Uh, that'll only be the second time uh, she'll be in front of the camera. We did a uh, podcast episode number 100, and we did that together, kind of a relationship episode. So uh, really excited to have her share, you know, just our journey and the way that we'll do it during that uh, episode. When it comes to those who never heard of Dr. Brian, right? How can people find you, uh, rather it's on Twitter or uh, other places? Yeah, Twitter's probably my most, uh, 
I'm mostly there, even though I regret it sometimes, but it's it's at Brian Lenskitz, it's at B-R-I-A-N, and then L-E-N, Z as in zebra, K-E-S. So that's where I'm, you know, I'm there a lot more than I probably should be. So I've been tapering back on that a bit. Uh, that's my other thing is is saying, okay, I don't want to get into, you know, too much on social media, but Instagram, it's at B Lenskis, and I haven't done anything there, but I think I'm going to be, are you in that neighborhood? In uh, Instagram? Yeah. Yeah, I'm there. I just kind of share some of the same stuff I do elsewhere, but yeah, I'm, I'm I hang out there. A All right, bit. man. Then I'll come over. I'll come over and try it as the new kids because you know I think it, it's it, there's a lot of toxicity on on Twitter, and I, I really don't want to be a part of that. There's a lot of diet wars and people arguing, mm-hmm. and I want to be positive influence. I really don't want to get drawn into those things. So those are the main things, and obviously low carb MD. Uh, and Life's Best Medicine podcast. That's where you find me the most and all my contact information is there too. And, and Dr. Um, Dr. Troy Tro has a virtual practice. Is yours just localized to San Diego? Do you do any virtual? Well, uh, I'm licensed in, in Arizona and California right now. Oh, so so okay. I mostly do California, but I do have some patients that come in from Arizona and I'm going to get more involved in the low carb community over there because we're all neighbors and, you know, a lot of patients from Northern California and, you know, in, in the, in the area. So yeah, I'm, my, my business is low carb MD San Diego.com. Okay. And, uh, it's all one word. So yeah, that's, that's where you track me down if you want to. Most people are trying to get away from me, but you know, that's the way <laughs> okay. it goes. All right. Well, I'm happy we're buddies. I'm happy we had a chance to see each other in person. And I know we're going to be doing more things together. Maybe we'll even do a continuing medical education for the clinicians who we really need to reach in a very near future with QMED CME. So, man, I appreciate you. Thank you for your time. I know you're going to be running to your family after this. So thanks so much for being with me today. Okay. Hey, thanks for the invite. Appreciate it. No problem. So guys, that concludes today's episode. An episode that I think serves as a friendly reminder that there are doctors out there who are not afraid to challenge the status quo. Doctors who have made reversing insulin resistance their life's work. I know it's my life's work, and I really appreciate having my other colleagues out there doing the same. So so if you haven't been successful partnering with your clinician to focus on metabolic health, just know if you simply search um, the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners site, Low Carb USA, the Diet Doctor, they all have search engines that will help you uh, find clinicians who understand metabolic health. But I always encourage patients to always engage your clinician first. You never know. You know, they may not be aware of metabolic health, but if you can just introduce them to it, I think that's a good way to get started. You know, the diet doctor has a free CME. Uh, so if you just, and we'll try to have a link to that, literally diet doctor free CME for clinicians. And that may be their initial like course, their initial way to get into this path. So they'll learn what they had learned elsewhere. So, so for those who are watching or listening, I really appreciate you for joining us today. And until the next episode, continue to be safe, be well, and continue to protect your nest.